Welcome to this episode of Eureka. We are going to have a really exciting conversation with the guest today, Mustan Sir Barma. He has been with the TAFR for quite a long time and then the issues that we are going to discuss are going to be very engaging and very interesting. Assume that there is about 1000 carbon-14 atoms just next to you. Just wait for 5370 years, out of the 1000, 500 would have become nitrogen-14 and 500 of course would remain as carbon-14 and wait for another 5370 years, out of that 500, 250 would have become nitrogen-14 and the remaining would be living as uh, carbon-14. We call this as half-life. This is not very interesting. The most interesting thing is, out of the 1000, how do you decide which one would convert to nitrogen-14 and which one would remain as carbon-14? That's people would call it as a random. That's a random, that's an area in which he has worked and that's what we are going to discuss. Before we continue with our discussion, let's take a quick look at his brief profile. Keep watching Eureka, we are going to have a very interesting conversation. Keep watching. Professor Mustansir Verma is a renowned theoretical physicist. Currently, he is Professor Emeritus at the TIFR Centre for Interdisciplinary Sciences in Hyderabad, which is a centre of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Professor Barma obtained his bachelor's degree from St. Xavier's College, University of Bombay and his PhD from State University of New York at Stony Brook. He did postdoctoral work at the Michigan State University in the US. Professor Verma joined TIFR Mumbai in 1976. Over the years, he has worked on phase transitions, disordered systems and non-equilibrium dynamics. With specialization in statistical physics and condensed matter physics, Professor Verma's research focuses on complex systems made up of many individual entities. For example, molecules in a fluid or spins in a magnet. Formerly, Professor Barma has served as Director and Distinguished Professor at TIFR Mumbai. He was also involved in initiating the new campus of TIFR in Hyderabad, with ambitious plans for research and training in the new areas of science. Between 2002 and 2005, Professor Barma served as Chair of the Commission on Statistical Physics of the International Union for Pure and Applied Physics and later as its Vice President. Besides fellowships from various science academies, Professor Verma has received awards including the SS Bhatnagar Prize and the SN Bose Centenary Medal for the Indian Science Congress. He was conferred the Padma Shri in 2013. Welcome back to Eureka. We are going to have a very interesting conversation with Dr. Barma. Let me start with this word, random. Okay, We hear it quite a long time, I mean people use it in very many ways. But as a physicist, how do you explain random or randomness? Sir? Well, randomness is what actually you and I think about. Something that you cannot predict. You don't know which way it will go. Toss a coin. Is it going to be heads or is it going to be tails? We don't, we're not sure. This, it's a good example of a random phenomenon. Mm -hmm. In the end, uh, uh, the intuitive appreciation of the word is the yes, right thing. Right thing. Is the right thing. Uh, many people will assume, suppose if I toss a coin, I get a three times head. Many people will assume that you no, know, the fourth time the chance for head is not that much. Uh, do you think so? No, of course not. I mean, because at each point the chance is exactly the same. But this is a very interesting point you raised because people have a mistaken notion that things should average out. They don't. Usually they don't. They may. I mean, of course there is a, a so-called law of averages but it doesn't act in the way that the fourth toss will be uh, more likely to be tails than heads. It's not true. Uh, that's an interesting point. And uh, let me come to your work. I mean, you have been working, I mean, you have been engaging with this, uh, uh, let's say, a monster called randomness uh, or a beauty called randomness. Uh, maybe after your research, you might have made the monster into a beauty. Uh, uh, What's your work basically was on? Like, how did you approach? What was the question that you uh, looked into? Yeah, so, well, I mean, certainly I'm not the first to look into randomness in 
physical systems. It goes back many years. Brownian motion, Einstein's work on uh, diffusion. So the, the point is that many, many processes that happen in the real world are best modeled as if they are random. I mean, even if you look at, uh, let's say, a small bit of uh, matter in a liquid, it is buffeted or it hit by so many molecules that its motion is complicated, erratic, and practically random. And the idea that this is basically a random motion is very, very important and effective. So that object or that particle in the liquid actually does what is called a random walk. It goes this way, then that way, unpredictably this way, and describes the trajectory. The fact that it does that, of course, is uh, plausible. But what Einstein did was to show that a quantitative measure of that would lead, in fact, surprisingly, to the determination of the Avogadro number. Oh, okay. I mean, and in fact, uh, until 1906, I believe, the Avogadro number was not known. It was only following the suggestion that the physicist Perrin actually measured uh, the way these particles move and was able to indirectly uh, deduce that. Okay, but uh, I, I, that's not what I work on. Uh, let, let me try to describe the uh, sort of problem. Suppose you take a handkerchief and you just uh, move it around. And suppose you have some particles on the handkerchief. You can Let's imagine. say I put paper drops uh, on yeah, the handkerchief exactly. and I'm holding it. That's right, paper. That's a very good example. Now, as you're shaking it, there are small valleys that form, the small hills that form. The paper will collect in the valleys. On the other hand, as you shake, the valley will become a hill, so it will fall out. It falls in or out. out. What happens after you do this for a long time? Okay. The answer is that the particles sort of come together uh -huh. and then they move around, they cluster. Uh -huh. Now, uh, so this is the sort of thing that I work on. You might ask why it's of interest. Uh, and I, I, I can just say that uh, although I don't work on this application, part application of it. Mm -hmm. directly, mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about pollutants in the atmosphere, I mean, they are buffeted by uh, currents, air currents, this, that. There are random forces which act on them, like the random, uh, uh, you know, forces on the pepper particles uh, on the handkerchief. So, the fact that randomness can lead to clustering, okay. you know, this is a the sort of uh, so which essentially mean that uh, perhaps for example the pollutant can cluster and maybe Indeed. one area might have a much more pollutant than other place that's right or maybe if you are looking at not as uh, atmospheric pollution but let's say uh, let's contagious disease Indeed. maybe uh, even which is you know randomly occurring places might also cluster to some place we don't know I mean, maybe that's some of right. this can uh, no, in general in random processes the issue of clustering is uh, an open question under what circumstances do this kind of less clustering. clustering happen? You know, so th th that's an interesting question. Uh, yeah. So this uh, brings me to uh, the next area, another major area which is related is uh, fluctuations. You have been studying at fluctuation, and then from that, uh, 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 you are trying to understand what kind of uh, effect we can kind of predict. Yeah. Out so of randomness and fluctuations are sort of like brother and sister. They go hand in hand. I mean. Uh, because what do we mean by a fluctuation? We mean a deviation from the average. Okay. Let's see. I mean, we are familiar with the stock market and fluctuations there, but that's not the sort of fluctuation I'm personally interested in. But, uh, uh, and in fact, you know, so if you ask me, the average is important because it tells you something about the system. But the average tells you about, you know, some property or value. Okay, fine. But the fluctuations tell you how the system behaves. And it's sort of much more interesting in that way. And uh, uh, fluctuations can be of all types. They can be large, they can be small. I mean, if you look at, uh, uh, for instance, um, a small volume inside a liquid, or, uh, let, or let's say, you know, a, a small volume right here in the room, the number of molecules that are in that volume will certainly fluctuate. But it will, the fluctuations are relatively small compared to the average number. But there can be circumstances in which 
the fluctuations are huge. And they're so large, they're big or bigger than the average. And those are the sorts of uh, Places systems that you're I'm, I'm personally interested in. Very, very interesting point. But uh, we'll yes. take a very small break. We'll continue this discussion. Keep watching, Eureka. We are going to continue this discussion. What happens if the fluctuations are occurring, where the fluctuations are much bigger or much smaller than the averages? What will happen? Let's uh, take a look at it. After a small break, keep watching, Eureka. We'll have a wonderful discussion. Welcome back to Eureka and we are having a very exciting conversation with Dr. Barma. The popular saying is that uh, misfortunes don't come alone, they come together. Uh, and uh, he was before the break talking about how during uh, fluctuations, uh, random fluctuations, there is a tendency of clustering. Uh, can you give us some kind of a real life example where, you know, I mean, people have been thinking about uh, such clustering happening, let's say at a molecular level or at uh, some weather phenomena or something like that, which you think uh, would be appropriate for us to understand what it means? Yeah, I mean, the idea of clustering is, of course, that things get together. Mm -hmm. That is what we mean by cluster. Um, now, one uh, example I can think about uh, is some recent work done from uh, 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 NCBS in Bangalore, uh, where uh, uh, Madan Rao and collaborators were looking at uh, how proteins cluster. It, the clustering is required for further bio biological functioning, but how do they cluster on the surface of a cell? And uh, the way they do it is through fluctuations. Okay. Yeah. What, what is fluctuating is not the proteins themselves, but the uh, actin um, uh, skeleton that holds the cell together and these fluctuations on which uh, translate into uh, motion of the cell surface mm -hmm. induce proteins to cluster. Oh. So, fluctuations drive clustering uh -huh. is… Uh, so, something is like your message. handkerchief. Very much like the handkerchief. In fact, okay. uh, the mm -hmm. cell surface is like a closed handkerchief. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my mind. My mind. Yeah. Ah, right. Very, very, very uh, interesting. I mean, another area that you have been working on is uh, what's called as phase transition. You know, one of the phase transition that uh, many of us would have experienced, let's say in our school, is or in everyday experiences, water turning to an ice or water turning into a steam. That's right. It happens at one go. Exactly. It's not like, you know, 50% of the water has turned. Uh, ice, the remaining is it. No, it doesn't happen like, you know, slowly. You bring it to zero degree temperature, right. if the water I mean, is pure, exactly. it uh, suddenly turns into an ice. Is there any other examples of this uh, where uh, that kind of sudden things happen and then what is it was your study about? So, there are, first of all, phase transitions are very common. They occur all over the place. I mean, uh, magnetism. Okay. As you change the sign of the magnetic field, the magnetization jumps suddenly. Okay. As you change the temperature, the magnetization, meaning the degree to which something is magnetized, mm -hmm. that goes to zero at a sharp temperature called the Curie temperature. So, after Curie temperature, your magnetic material will become totally non magnetic. Non magnetic. Right. Oh, yeah. okay. Right, exactly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, and all of a sudden. All of a sudden. Uh -huh. Well, all of a sudden, meaning that, that transition. it may take time, uh -huh. but what is sudden is the, the temperature. temperature. Okay. Uh -huh. Beyond that temperature, it is not. Yeah. Uh -huh. But, you know, the real mystery about phase transitions, the way at least I think about it, is the following. See, consider boiling. Okay, you take some liquid, you raise the temperature 90 degrees, it expands a little, 91, 92, 99, it's just uh, you know, expanding a little bit. Now you come to 100 and lo and behold, you boil. What happens? Liquid turns to vapor. What is liquid? Liquid is a large number of molecules which are close together. Vapor is the same except that they are much further apart. In fact, for boiling of water, the density difference is about 1,700. And if you take a cube root of that, that's about 12. What does that mean? That means that two atoms which were this close Let's together, say one. Uh -huh. After vapor, it becomes suddenly 12. That's right. So, one, one unit becomes 12. 12. Uh -huh. And all of them do it together. At the same time. At the same, inst at the same point. Yeah. Point, point. Uh -huh. at, that, at that temperature. Uh -huh. So, it's a collective effect. 
It's like, for example, in a school when there is a bell, all yeah. the students That's just right. jump out and go away. Exactly, but here there's no bell and yeah, there's yeah. a temperature. Okay. Uh -huh. Exactly. So uh -huh. why does this happen? Why is there a collective effect? Why do things act collectively? Now, there, are, there is a theory, there is some understanding of this, but this to me remains a source of, you know, intrigue. intrigue. Uh -huh. Yeah, Very yeah. Good. Yeah, so uh, this is a kind of phase transition. Yeah, okay. this is what kind of areas in phase transition that you worked on? Like, uh, can you tell us some few words about it? Right. So, I mean, as I said, phase transitions occur all over. I mean, I, my early work was on magnetism, mm -hmm. but there's another very interesting sort of phase transition that arises in having to do with connections. Okay. Yeah. In the sense that, imagine that you have a box, uh -huh. and then you have random connections put in here and there. What is the first time that you will connect across? Now, the reason this is relevant is because you might have insulator and you're putting in a little bit of conducting material. When will you first connect and let a current go through? Okay, okay. And it again happens at a sharp transition if you put these randomly. So the fraction at which you percolate, as it's called, uh -huh. is sharp. Okay. And uh, it's a different sort of example of phase transition again. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, uh, modeling a disordered material, let's say, for instance. Very, very, very interesting question that you uh, involved. Something that we experience in everyday life, maybe studied in school, but then we never knew the depth, I mean, the kind of uh, interesting, uh, uh, you know, characteristic that it has. Let me now ask you a very, very different question. Uh, you come from a family who are largely in business, you know, uh, people, I mean, your relatives are, uh, you know, largely in business, you know, various things. I mean. And you seem to be a kind of, uh, let's say, uh, black sheep who moved away from money to uh, science. How did it happen? What prompted you to take science? I mean, well, many things. I mean, it's not just one thing. But uh, first of all, uh, I'd say the family atmosphere was very open. My father, although in business, actually had had an electrical engineering degree. School also contributed, and. Uh, you know, I remember a particular incident in, I forget which class it was, we were learning about optics. And in those days, you know, it was 1950s, we used to use textbooks by British authors. Uh -huh. And uh, there was this book which said that, look, uh, if you have mirrors, and you, you know, depending on the angle between mirrors, you'll get so many images. And if they're parallel... So if can, I put two mirrors, one facing each other? Yes, exactly facing each other. And you put a candle in between, then the book said that you'll have an infinite number of images. But then I thought to myself, how can it be infinite? If you put the candle, the speed of light is finite. So which Maybe, means that the light will go here, yes. create one image, go here, create an image. Then after some time, it has to go here and create an image. So which means it cannot be finite in... Uh, in a sense, in yes, a sense. exactly. Uh -huh. So It can be a very large number, very, very large number, but certainly not infinite. Yeah, yeah not in a finite time. Uh, so, at that point, I wrote a letter to this uh, author of the text. You wrote a letter to the author of yeah, the text. Yeah, okay, yeah. very and interesting. In those days, we used to use air letters. So, I sent an air letter to him and he responded in kind in an, on an, in, uh, with an air letter. And he wrote, uh, you know, that uh, it's an interesting point that you have raised. And he wrote further that I'm glad that you don't believe everything that is written and you question everything. So, so Question everything. And That's a very important point. This is actually uh -huh. very important. I mean, uh, because in science today, in research and so on, we realize it's answers are not as important as the questions. If you ask the right question, the answer will come. You know, so the that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very interesting, very, 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 uh, I mean, I suppose, uh, very exciting stuff. We may need to take a very short break. We'll continue this conversation. We'll talk about this interdisciplinary center that is being established in Hyderabad, what are they doing interdisciplinary after the break? Keep watching Eureka. We'll come back with this interesting conversation. Welcome back to Eureka and we are having a very, very exciting and interesting conversation with Dr. Barma, who is a Professor Emeritus with the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, their campus in Hyderabad. This campus in Hyderabad was established when you were the Director of uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. I mean, uh, yes, it's a newer period that it got established. Yes. Why did you want to have another center when you already had a Tata Institute of Fundamental Research? What was this major uh, 
if I can say so, you know, what was its motive for having such an institute? Right. I mean, the impetus for having a new center of uh, the uh, TIFR uh, ultimately had to do with growing. We are keen to grow into areas of science that are new, new generally and also new for us. And uh, we explored various uh, options. We finally uh, decided that we would like to establish a large new campus in Hyderabad. If I could say, TIFR, as I said, has many centers. There is the Homi Bhabha Center for Science Education. Yeah. There is the National Center for Radio Astrophysics in Pune. National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore. There was a Center for Applicable Mathematics also in Bangalore and, and so on. But these, each of these centers had a particular theme and they excelled in that, that particular one particular thing. In that. Yeah. The idea of TI for Hyderabad was to have a large campus with many, all these and more uh, uh, disciplines all together. But to start with, we thought that we will choose an interdisciplinary approach. Yeah, uh, and I was also told that you are looking at uh, not just a uh, incremental growth but uh, into a very big growth in near future. That's, that's what's the, true. What's the kind of vision that you have for this uh, Hyderabad campus? Well, we would like it to be very large because the state government has been uh, generous and we have a large amount of land. Uh, we would uh, envisage uh, ultimately about 250 faculty in the Hyderabad campus. Um, and the one difference from the existing uh, uh, campus in Bombay would be the number of students. Number of students who would be uh, who would be here. Uh -huh. So it would be a, a, a very large number, six, let's say five or six times the number of faculty, mm -hmm. plus a large number of postdocs. So students and postdocs combined would be about two thousand. Two thousand uh, students, I mean, the PhD students, students and, and postdocs post 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 together, post and many visitors. Mm -hmm. So we hope to have a very vibrant academic atmosphere which sort of thrives on the younger, uh, uh, you know, yes. scientists uh, driving it. Uh, actually, uh, if we look at the landscape in India, you yes. know, such kind of a big institute with the various divisions and department at one roof, mm. uh, having large number of students is Indian Institute of Science. Yes. So in some sense, uh, this would become another place where a large number of students with uh, different disciplines will uh, come under Absolutely. one place. Absolutely, that's right. And for a growing country like India, that I suppose is a very, very important stuff, right? Th this is extremely important mm -hmm. on, on many counts. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, f for instance, today we have the ICERs, mm -hmm. which are producing a large number of very talented, very good students uh, graduating with an integrated uh, course with a master's degree. And we would like to afford an excellent and cutting edge place for uh, selected students from the ISIS to do, do a PhD rather than consider options abroad. Here's something equally, if not, equally good, if not better. So this is one aspect. The other aspect is that we would also be employing uh, many upcoming young scientists, uh, uh, you know, as the years go by in building up the faculty here. So I think both at the student level and at the faculty level, uh, yeah. there is this um, connection with the, the uh, larger landscape in the country. And uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, this center really will drive many new initiatives in many areas of science. If you look at our undergraduate education, and if we focus only on science education, uh, people say that it's in a very appalling condition. The undergraduate education is also devoid of laboratories, mm -hmm. practically doing science, uh, or even, uh, you know, peripheral uh, exposure to uh, research. What do you think ails our science education, particularly at uh, school level and uh, undergraduate level, and what do you think where we should focus so that we can come out of this uh, problem? Um. Well, first of all, I'd like to say there is a spectrum, I mean, even today. Uh, but you are right that uh, many schools and perhaps colleges also do not emphasize um, the laboratory aspect as much as they should. 
it's very easy to teach on a blackboard and, and tell students that, look, if you do this, if you uh, uh, take water and you raise the temperature, uh, this is what will happen at a certain temperature. But of course, that's not quite the same thing as seeing the phenomenon itself. So it's crucial that we move away from this only blackboard method to uh, uh, situations where students are exposed to phenomena happening and engineered by themselves. So uh, I think the laboratory um, approach is essential in order to promote the idea of tinkering, to let students explore what happens when uh, uh, things are done differently and not only at the level of ideas but at the level of turning a screwdriver. So something like for example today people talk about innovation. If you want to actually cultivate the culture of innovation, tinkering is a very important aspect that's and correct. I suppose that's what uh, Absolutely. We, we should move towards. Th 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 that uh, in part and uh, certainly the Homi Baba Centre for Science Education today and hopefully the science education effort wherever will emphasize new and innovative laboratory experiments, not the standard ones that, you know, one is used to do this and take a measurement, not quite that, but design it yourself, see what you get. You have been a director of uh, TAFR, which uh, is considered not just one of the topmost institute in, in India, but also one of the world class institute. And you have been director for a very long period in that uh, place. So what do you think is our major challenge for basic sciences in India? Yeah, okay. Uh, the one thing I would say is uh, important is just numbers. Uh, we do have some institutes of excellence throughout the country and TIFR is one and there are ma many others. You mentioned IIS and there are several others, but they are not enough. And uh, this is the biggest challenge today. And uh, we have such a large pool of talent. I mean, we are seeing this in uh, our... Uh, student interviews today and we are finding that whereas earlier students would always come from the metros, the large metros, not true any longer. Yeah. We have s such talented people coming from all over the country. The so base if, we need to build on. So if we actually concentrate on young people from all over the country, including yes. villages and small towns, That's right. we can become a great nation. We need to end this program here. We had a very wonderful conversation. Thanks. We had a very exciting conversation. We learnt a lot. We saw many uh, insightful stuff. Keep watching Eureka. We'll come back with another conversation next week, same time.